Good morning from Washington, D.C. Uh, my name is Anwar Bukharsk, and I am a, <clears throat> a professor of counterterrorism and counter violent extremism at the Africa Center uh, for Strategic Studies. And I want to extend a very uh, warm welcome to the many Africa Center alumni, uh, distinguished colleagues and friends who have joined us today for this webinar on why Shabbat persists in, in Somalia. Now I would like to pass it over to our director, Kate Arquestmoff, to say a few words about the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. Kate. Thank you, Anwar, and uh, good day uh, to all the colleagues uh, joining us. Uh, we're so delighted to have you, uh, uh, we hope, with us once again, or for the first time. Uh, for those of you who may not know the Africa Center for Strategic Studies, uh, we are uh, a forum for research, for academic programs, and the exchange of ideas with the aim of enhancing citizen security by strengthening the effectiveness and accountability of African institutions. We are a Department of Defense Regional Center located at the National Defense University in Washington, D.C. And we carry out our mission of advancing African security by expanding understanding, providing a trusted platform for dialogue, building enduring partnerships, and catalyzing strategic solutions. Accordingly, we seek to generate relevant insight and analysis that informs practitioners and policymakers on topical and emerging security trends and on effective responses to dynamic and complex security challenges. And recognizing that addressing serious challenges can only come about through candid and thoughtful exchanges, the Africa Center provides opportunities for partners to exchange views on shared interests and sound practices. And by engaging together, military and civilian, government and civil society, as well as national, regional, and international, we hope to reinforce that we all have valuable roles to play in mitigating the complex drivers of conflict and insecurity on the continent today through enduring and capable institutions. And this kind of dialogue infused with real world experiences and fresh analysis, we hope provides an opportunity for continued learning and catalyzes concrete actions. Uh, so thank you for joining us uh, for this uh, important dialogue today on why Al-Shabaab still persists in Somalia. Thank you in advance uh, to our panelists uh, for bringing us your expertise and your insights. Uh, and uh, back to you, Anwar, uh, to help moderate our conversation. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Kate. Um, and now let's begin our session on why Shabaab persists in, in Somalia. And we have three distinguished panelists uh, that will provide an in-depth look at the origins, motivations, and, and drivers of Shabaab. Um, and their analysis will consider uh, dynamics in, in, in the group's composition, you know, its objectives over time, as well as the political and economic factors um, that have enabled Shabaab to persist. Until very recently, the conventional wisdom among Somali officials and some in the international community was that um, Shabab was receding. <clears throat> I mean, having suffered significant losses of territory and influence in Somalia. Uh, today, however, you know, experts can see that the group is once again resurgent um, and prospect for its defeat you know, appeared distant. So Shabab has demonstrated the ability to to regain lost territory, to bolster uh, recruitment, and to raise revenues from taxation and extortion to fund its lethal asymmetric war um, against the, the African Union mission, Amazon, and Somali forces. Uh, in Kenya, which has suffered most of Shabab's strikes outside Somalia, I mean, the group has ramped up its attacks you know, on government and security personnel along the Kenya-Somali border. Uh, in northeastern Kenya, Shabab has pursued its targeting of security personnel and installation, you know, cell phone uh, towers, and communication masts. Uh, in the first half of 2021, <clears throat> dozens of police and soldiers were either wounded or killed by IED blasts. Civilians, especially non uh, locals, have also uh, continued to bear the brunt of Shabab attacks. Uh, the group has targeted you know, teachers, health workers, public administration, uh, administrators, uh, construction workers to force these professionals who come from outside the region to leave in large numbers. And this uptick in violence has occurred, you know, despite the intensification of counterterrorism operations, uh, despite foreign air and, and ground operations. 
So as it has been the case in Shabab's decade and, and a half, long violent um, extremist insurgency, the group remains lethal uh, in Somalia and it remains dangerous um, outside it. So as I said, despite suffering uh, several military setbacks and um, an occasional internal splits, Shabab has demonstrated the ability to regroup, uh, to tactically evolve, and then to expand geographically. The group has also been adept at exploiting inter-clan conflict and political factionalism in Somalia. So this ability of adaptation to changing circumstances requires a better understanding of the composition, you know, of the motivations and objectives, um, as well as the drivers and enabling factors of a Shabab. It also necessitates a uh, better clarity of the political economy of violent extremism in Somalia. <clears throat> That's why we are privileged uh, today to have three outstanding uh, experts to walk us through this process, of trying to understand, of trying to diagnose you know, violent extremism in Somalia by providing an in-depth understanding you know, of the major characteristics of um, violent extremism and of Shabab. Um, and we have uh, Mohammed Haj Jiras with us. He's a visiting professor uh, at the African Leadership Center, <clears throat> King's College London. Most recently, he was a conflict research fellow at the London School of Economics and Political Science. Uh, he's a book reviews editor for both the Journal of Somali Study and the Journal of Anglo Somali society is the author of, um, of numerous you know, articles that were published in, in prestigious academic journals. And he's the author of, um, of a few books. Uh, one of them is The Suicidal State in Somalia, The Rise and Fall of uh, Siad Bar Regime. It was published in the University Press <clears throat> of America in 2016. And his research ranges widely uh, and invokes the disciplines of anthropology, history, and, and, and political science. Uh, the second speaker is Dr. Orly uh, Maya Stern. Uh, she's a researcher, consultant, and human rights lawyer from, from South Africa. Uh, she's an authority on international law, gender, human rights, and, and security, particularly in countries affected by conflict um, and instability. And over the past decade, she has worked and conducted research in numerous countries including Iraq, Somalia, South Sudan, Nigeria, Central African Republic, uh, Sierra Leone, uh, Uganda, Kenya, and uh, South Africa. And her expertise spans uh, international law, in particular international humanitarian law and international human rights, armed conflict, gender, and gender-based violence, uh, and access to justice and security. And she holds a PhD in law from the London School of, of Economics. And finally, we have Dr. Uh, Mr. Omar Mahmoud, and he's the senior analyst for Somalia at the International Crisis Group. Uh, and in this capacity, Omar uh, conducts field research, provides written um, analysis, proposes policy recommendations, uh, and engages in advocacy efforts. And Omar has previously worked as a senior researcher focusing on the Horn of Africa for the Institute of Security Studies in Addis Ababa, and as an international consultant you know, covering Boko Haram and the Lake Chad Basin. Uh, prior to that, he obtained his master's degree from the Fletcher School um, at Tufts University and served as a US Peace Corps volunteer in, in Burkina Faso. Uh, <clears throat> so with that, I'll, uh, let, let's start and I'll turn to, uh, to Mohammed. Um, Mohammed, it's, uh, it, it, is, it is critical to, to understand the workings of, of violent extremist groups. Uh, the objectives, you know, the motivations of Shabab, I think, uh, must be understood along with their structures, uh, along with their strategies. So, you know, if you can talk us through um, Shabab's origins, you know, and motivations and, and, and drivers. Yeah, no, thanks. First of all, as I was called first on behalf of my other distinguished panelists, 
I would like to thank the organizers of this webinar on why Al-Shabaab persists in Somalia. It's really a delightful opportunity today to be with the Africa Center for Strategic Studies of National Defense University. I especially thank Professor Anwar Bohars for the invitation to participate in this discussion. I hope my answers provide a rather comprehensive introduction to the dynamics of Al-Shabaab. In so doing, I attempt to assess competing explanations of Al-Shabaab's domestic and external policies and politics. Without further ado, let me answer the question about Al-Shabaab's origins, motivations, drivers, and objectives. First, Al-Shabaab's actual name is Harakat Al-Shabaab Al-Mujahidun. That is exactly how they call themselves. There is a discrepancy among academics and analysts who study Al-Shabaab over the exact date of the emergence of Al-Shabaab. Some say it was 2003 or 2004, Others say 2005, but there is no question that the first time Al-Shabaab officially came to announce its existence it was June 2006, when its leaders held a kind of widely held convention in Mogadishu in the summer of that year. At the time, Al-Shabaab was part and parcel of the Union of the Islamic Courts, UIC, which captured the capital city from the hands of hated so-called warlords who were enemies of the UIC. These warlords had been facilitated and funded by the CIA and the US State Department through the US Embassy in Nairobi, Kenya. Indeed, Al-Shabaab was acting or imitating to act as the fighting force or wing of the UIC before the Ethiopian force contingents, backed up by the Pentagon with intelligence and funding, invaded Mogadishu and defeated the UIC in December 2006. In retrospect, Al-Shabaab stemmed from Al-Itihad al-Islami, an earlier Islamic organization which had advocated forcefully and militarily like Al-Shabaab to impose a strict Salafist Islamic rule in Somali inhabited regions of the Horn of Africa, including Somalia. Al-Itihad's emergence was inspired by the events in Afghanistan in 1989 as the military regime in Somalia had oppressed Islamic groups in the country for fear of being deposed by the Islamic groups, the emerging Islamic groups. Nonetheless, al Ittihad, who some of its members were Afghan war alumni, was disintegrated in the late 1990s, following a dispute and internal power struggle between its leaders. Most of the main leaders of al Ittihad became al Ittihad and Al-Shabaab was part of this offshoot of al Ittihad, as young fighters before some prominent hardliners of Al-Shabaab went aside and created a movement within a movement. This movement was named Al-Shabaab, which means the youth in Arabic. It is in interesting to highlight that under al Ittihad's offshoot of Ittisan, the elder leaders like Sheikh Hassan Dai were called within the movement as Odayasha, which means all the men in Somali while the young members of the movement were called as Yarad, which means youth in Somali, after the Latin name was Arabized as Al-Shabaab in 2006. Al-Shabaab's motivation is while it was part of the UIC, as well as its objective was to impose and implement Sharia law. But after the Ethiopian invasion in 2006 and the intervention of the African Union forces in 2007, Al-Shabaab added it is goal one more critical element, which was to drive foreign forces out of Somalia. And it has been continuing to enforce militarily their objectives and mo motivations since March 2007 up to now. Back to Anwar. Thank you. Uh Mohammed, so <clears throat> Shabab's aim is to replace the federal government of Somalia with its own version of, uh, of an Islamic uh, government, and, <clears throat> and, the group, and the group also uh, demands the withdrawal of foreign forces from, from Somalia. And that takes me to the second question, you know, about the membership structure of Shabab. I mean, what is this membership, and, and how significant are women's place and, and role in this structure? Uh, thanks, Anwar, again. Um, how Al-Shabaab is currently structured is much more different from how it was structured in the beginning when it was established. 
unlike the UIC or any other Islamic movement in Somalia, Al-Shabaab is not a purely Somali movement, which means that its members consist of Somalis and non-Somalis alike. Anyone can join Al-Shabaab in the past as well as in the present, regardless of nationality, if he or she believes in the strict Islamic Salafi beliefs of Al-Shabaab. That's why you can find an American, a European, an African, and an Arab in the midst of Al-Shabaab. However, recent years have witnessed a decline of Arabs, Americans, and Europeans joining Al-Shabaab. This can be related to the loss of influence of the Arabs, Americans, and Europeans in the Al-Shabaab leadership since the assassination of the US-born prominent member of Al-Shabaab, Omar Hamani, known as Abu Mansour al-Amriki, whose killing in September 2013 was ordered by the then leader of Al-Shabaab. Still, Al-Shabaab attracts many Africans from East Africa into its domain. These Africans were trained and sent to operate in countries like Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania, as far as Mozambique. Today, the hardcore leaders of Al-Shabaab, mainly like the main leader, it is Minister of Defense, it is Minister of Finance, and other top leaders are from the dominant clans and communities in Somalia. While in an interesting comparison, the foot soldiers of Al-Shabaab largely hail from specific marginalized clans and communities in Southern Somalia. As and also and, uh, for the role and beliefs of women in Al-Shabaab, women do not categorically play a decisive leadership role within Al-Shabaab, other than being wives and sisters in which they play as advisors and assistants to their husbands and brothers. For a more important role, women are sometimes sent as spies to the Somali government offices to report on the activities of potential targets. So th these are the membership structure of Al-Shabaab Anwar. Uh, thank you, um, Mohammed. So Shabaab is, is complex, obviously, in its membership uh, yeah. uh, uh, composition. And, and you have described, uh, <clears throat> I mean, here and, and elsewhere, how Shabaab uh, having three you know, main components that define its, its structure. The first is the <clears throat> ideological component, right, which includes uh, a few individuals and from which the leadership, uh, the exercise of leadership flows. Uh, the second uh, layer is the most fragmented. Um, <clears throat> and um, But here, personal gains is the main uh, goal, and, um, and they're mostly uh, and educated youth, and they come from impoverished families uh, induced by fin financial rewards. And there is there is a third component uh, of fighters which constitute the bulk of, <clears throat> of the movement here. And these are uh, motivated by, by, uh, by grievances, right, based on, on how their communities are politically marginalized and, and economically excluded here. So how does this understanding of the group's membership and, and motivations, why is it important that we, we delve into this and, and can it offer potential openings, obviously, uh, for disengagement from violent extremism? Yes, yes indeed, thanks, Anwar. al Shabaab's resilience as a strong regional player in East <clears throat> Africa, in the Horn of Africa, as well as generally in Africa, raises the importance of rethinking how to deal with Al-Shabaab. A closer understanding would certainly offer more understandable ways of dealing with Al-Shabaab, such as talking directly to those hardcore members of Al-Shabaab, who are some of them willing to negotiate with an unacceptably legitimate government of Somalia, which does not exist at the time, at this time, even though the African Union, the United Nations, and the European Union and the United States repeated the echo at one way that existed in Somalia. So it's important to uh, reconsider first how to understand deeply within the whole political and policy dynamics of Al-Shabaab, both domestically and externally, as well as uh, their present and past motivations and how they themselves divided themselves along the nationalistic and Islamic lines, as well as ideological material lines and different. It's a kind of a complicated thing. So I would sum up here, Professor Anwar, back to you. Okay, thank you, uh, Mohammed. I think you did a, um, a good job giving us a, a better understanding of the composition and 
motivations, objectives uh, of, uh, of Shabbat. It's also, you know, important to have a better clarity of the political economy of violent extremism in, in Somalia. And Somalia can be uh, described as having a classic <clears throat> war economy. And Shabab is a central player uh, in this war uh, economy. Um, you know, critical to the um, to the to the group's endurance, as as Dr. Ori, uh, my turn to whom I'll turn in, in a second. You know, she has written extensively on this. Is it is the ability of of Shabab to generate uh, um, resources, and as with all you know, uh, other violent extremist movements and armed insurgencies, Shabab needs uh, resources to, you know, to pay its, its, its fighters, to pay its personnel, to cover its uh, cost, operation costs, to buy goods, equipment, uh, to carry out attacks, etc. So uh, as, as, as Dr. Ali wrote, uh, Shabab spends, you know, a lot of time and manpower generating revenue. In fact, the group has funded its insurgency uh, through a, a range of, of means. So I'll, I'll turn to, uh, um, to, uh, to you, Orly. Um, so if you can briefly you know, walk us through the <clears throat> Shabab's role in, in, the, in the war economy and, and, and tell us some of the key facets of a Shabab's uh, uh, income generation. Uh, what have you found in, in your research? I mean, can you document these multifaceted means by which Shabab generate funds. So, Orly? Great. Well, first of all, let me say thank you for having me presenting today and a warm, a warm regards to everybody from Cape Town, South Africa. Um, so, I've been in Somalia for about four years now. I've been working as the human rights advisor on the Al Shabab Defectors Program. And one of my roles has been to conduct a number of pieces of research about Al Shabab. And one of those pieces looked in quite a lot of detail at the war economy. Now, um, as was just said a minute ago, like Al-Shabaab has high expenses and they've managed to keep, one of, one of the main reasons that they've managed to keep their insurgency going for so long has been because they've managed to generate so much money. Um, in terms of self-funding, Al-Shabaab has actually been one of the most successful insurgency groups that there's been. Um, the, the, the actual figures are quite unknown, but, um, Around uh, at its peak, around 2011, it was estimated that they had an annual revenue of around 70 to 100 million dollars for the year. And just to put that into to a, a basis for comparison, the 20, 2020 federal government of Somalia's budget was 495 million, of which 296 million was provided by international partners. So Al Shabaab generated about half of what the Somali government uh, government generated in in last in the last financial year. So we're talking really, really large amounts of money that this group has managed to, to generate. Now, in order to do this, they've actually created a quite diverse portfolio of, of revenue earning streams. While other insurgent groups in other parts of the world have been able to rely on quite a lot of natural resources, on oil, on minerals, and that sort of thing, Al-Shabaab has not had access to those because that's not available in Somalia. And so they've come up with a much more creative portfolio, diverse portfolio of, earning, of, of revenue streams. And they've used that over a number of years to keep the, the group going. And I mean, it, it's a wide array of things that they do to generate income. It includes on the one end taxation, a very a, 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 a quite a hectic taxation regime, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a few minutes. They tax people in the population, they tax companies and businesses, they tax movement, any vehicles that travel on Al Shabaab's roads, any port, uh, ships that come into the ports, a cut of what they what transiting are given to Al Shabaab. They they do, you, uh, make money from extortion, from smuggling, from sugar and and charcoal. They also make money from some of the traditional, the traditional illicit industries, guns, drugs, the cut industry. And um, I'll talk to some of those in a few minutes. Um, and in addition, they also get money from external jihadist funding streams. So they get money from, um, from Al Qaeda, they get money from other jihadi contributions, um, as well as the fact that they also um, tax money from humanitarian aid. So what you see is this group, which almost more than, more than any other group that I've seen, has a really like incredibly diverse um, way, a set of ways in which they earn money. Now, let me talk about a few of them, a few of the really interesting ones. I think that like probably the most fascinating and probably the most important is Al-Shabaab's taxation regime. And just to say, Al-Shabaab is taxing everyone and everything. 
The taxation is very heavy in Al-Shabaab controlled territory, but this extends way beyond Al-Shabaab controlled territory into Mogadishu, into other parts of the country which are run by the government as well. And they're taxing on everything. So the best known tax is called the Zaka tax. Al-Shabaab keeps a list of all the businesses around the country and they keep, they visit shops, they visit warehouses and they put together inventories of the stock of the resources the companies around the company have and the earnings that they're making. And they charge a 2.5% tax on that to all companies around the country. And at the end of the year, companies have to all give this money to, to Al-Shabaab. And if they don't give it, the results are, are, are very extreme. People are killed, um, people are, bomb, bombings are done. It's said that a number of the major bombings of hotels and of facilities in, in Mogadishu have been around the issue of owners refusing to pay, pay tax and, have, and they've had very, very significant violent repercussions for that. Um, what's interesting about the Zakat tax is that it's got a, a religious justification. Zakat is a is a Muslim religious duty to purify the soul through giving alms. It's supposed to be money that's given to the poor. And Al-Shabaab claims it as zakah, but, but a, a lot of research suggests that they actually give very, very little of this to the poor. The amount of it that's going to the poor is very little. And in fact, when you interview people in Somalia, what you hear is many stories of families that are forced into destitution because of the fact that Al-Shabaab takes so much of this zakah from them. Um, customs duty and duty on movement is a re another really, really important form of, um, of taxation that they do. Um, the manifests and the bills of lading of boats that are coming into the Mogadishu port and coming into the other ports along the, the Somali coastline are leaked ahead of time to Al-Shabaab. So that by the time a, a ship docks in the port, Al-Shabaab already knows about what the contents of the ship are, and then they take a piece of tax from that. Um, in, uh, Al Shabab runs many of the main thoroughfares and roads across the country, particularly in, the, in, uh, in different parts of the country that they control. Any vehicle that passes over these roads has to pay a, a, a fee to pass in the roads. And the fees are quite significant. So I'll give you some numbers. Each truck is taxed 555 US dollars to pass. Each larger truck is, to, is, is um, taxed $1,150 to pass. So these are like tremendous amounts of money every single time a truck is passing an Al-Shabaab roadblock. They're taxing for farming produce. And um, I'll, I'll give you some numbers just because they're really interesting. Uh, heavy duty tractors operating license taxed at $750. A drilling, a well drilling registration free fee, $3,000. A Toyota minivan registration fee, $2,000. A car registration, a, a registration fee, $200. A, a, a fee to bring a camel to market, $5. A, key, a, a fee to bring a cow to market, $2. So every single bit of movement, every bit of, a bit of commerce that's going on, Al-Shabaab is taking a cut of. And it's coming up with these staggering amounts of money. Um, Al-Shabaab, there's, there's other taxes as well, as well. I won't go into the details of them. But one more that I'll mention here is, is, is called the infak. And it's, one of, it's said to be one of Al-Shabaab's most disliked practices, as opposed to the zaka, which at least has some sort of a alleged religious justification. The infarc tax is just predatory. They go, when they run out of money, when they need more money, they say to people in the population, you have to give us money, and they, and they, and they just take big chunks. And that's a, that's a tax which is, has upset many in the population. It's said to be one of their most unpopular ones. Um, Sugar and charcoal, you know, as you, as you all know, Al Shabab falls along, uh, sorry, Somalia falls along a, lo a long coastline with a number of ports. Um, built, uh, things that are coming in and out of the port and crossing over, over Somalia into Ken Kenya provide a number of different op um, opportunities for earning. So what we see is that ships coming in with coming into Somalia with sugar come into to the port and then they leave the port again with charcoal. And as they come, Al Shabab takes a cut of the sugar, takes a cut of the charcoal. That's then taken over to Kenya where the KDF, the Kenyan Defense Force also takes a cut. What we see interestingly is that Al Shabab is colluding with the Kenyan Defense Force in the transit of these goods, despite the fact that these groups are allegedly against each other and at war with each other. So they're fighting each other, they're at war, except for when it comes to earning, in which case there's, there's collusion. Um, I'm not going to go into that into much uh, into much more detail. The final thing I'll say is that in addition to these sort of taxations, Al Shabab also runs a number of different legitimate businesses around the country. So they've got businesses both legal and illegal, but many of the actual regular businesses in the country, Al Shabab's got their hand in, or Al Shabab just blatantly controls. So in addition to the taxation and everything else, they're also a very very important kind of player in business around the country. And a final point that I'll make is that in Al Shabab territory, Al Shabab are the main employer. So Al Shabab is strong across many of the different rural parts of the country. There's high levels of unemployment. There's very very few economic opportunities. And the one employer in town is Al Shabab. 
And so if we're thinking about Al-Shabaab membership, one of the big draw cards of Al-Shabaab is that it provides a job and economic opportunities in places where very few of those exist. Let me hand back, thank you. Um, excellent, uh, Orly, thank you. It, it, um, it's interesting, I mean, how Shabab uses this range of means I mean, to, to generate finance and how it employs the combination of uh, both licit and illicit uh, 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 trades. Uh, uh, as you noted, you know, the group has, has created a diversified approach to, to financing. And these included uh, what you just uh, nicely uh, highlighted and uh, went into detail, the taxation of goods, services, you know, domestic produce, uh, how it imposes custom duties at ports, borders, uh, airports, how it uh, has this taxing movement through checkpoints, how it engages in business and trade itself, in smuggling contraband, uh, sugar smuggling, uh, charcoal exports, and, and it also makes money off, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, international uh, aid as, as as well. So it seems like it's a, a sophisticated financial management. And as you you wrote in that excellent piece that we uh, sent to, to our participants, sophisticated financial management is key to the Shabab's uh, capabilities. Uh, in, in, in this case. So that takes me to the, to the second um, question. Uh, and because we have interpretation running, if, if we can slow down a little bit, uh, uh, that would be much uh, appreciated. Um, Shabab has <coughs> an interesting you know, relationship with, with women, uh, most notably when it comes to the, to the economy. So based on your research, I mean, what parts do women play in, in Shabbat's economic endeavors? Um, and obviously, can you present evidence as to women's roles in, in this diverse economic activities that, uh, that, you, uh, that you described? Orly? Uh, well, well, first of all, let me just step back and start with just talking about Al-Shabaab's approach to women in just a little bit more detail. Al-Shabaab is a highly patriarchal group with very, very conservative views about the roles of women and men. And in the territories that they're up, they, they occupy, they've made a number of rules around women's place and what women can and can't do. So as I think most people here will know, there's a strict dress code for women. There's a lot of restrictions around what women can do. But amongst the most important restrictions are women are not allowed to work. They're not allowed to run businesses. Al-Shabaab has a view that a woman's place is in the home, a woman's place is supporting her husband, a woman's place is not in the public space working. And so there's quite strict rules that they have around women working. Um, I'm not going to go into much detail about this now, but just to say that these rules are very, very inconsistently applied. So while women, while officially women are not allowed to work, there's a lot of evidence about the fact that women do work. And often women working is actually just seen as another opportunity to extract fines from women. So they say they can't work, the women have to work because they need the money, and then Al-Shabaab will extort fines from them for doing that. So I, I'm not saying that women don't work. In fact, they often do, but officially their rule is that this is not permitted. What's really, really interesting then is given that women are officially not permitted to work, Al-Shabaab uses women quite extensively in their economic endeavors. And um, I'll tell you how I came to this. I, I've, been in, I've been involved in a number of big pieces of research around women and Al-Shabaab, where I was very much researching women's military roles, women's roles in the insurgency. And I kept on coming up for, with interviews, kept on telling me more and more things about the roles that women were playing in Al-Shabaab's economy. And at first, I didn't really take it very seriously. I thought, you know, compared to the, the insurgency-related roles, this wasn't really that important. But over a period of about three years, I kept on hearing about this more and more and more and started to piece together this picture of women actually playing quite a significant part in Al-Shabaab's income generating capacity. And given that the income generating capacity is so important to the group's persistence, it occurred to me that this is something that we really need to be understanding more about and taking more cognizance of. And so the first thing I saw, or I came to understand from talking to people about this, is that Al-Shabaab runs this wide array of businesses around the country. And what more and more people started telling me was that women are often the fronts of these businesses. Women are often running these businesses. Women are like the key people running these Al-Shabaab businesses, despite the fact that women technically are not allowed to be involved in business in their territory. And um, people told me lots of different things. And I, I'll read a few quotes that, that people told me because I think they illustrated really nicely. But people were telling me that like what Al-Shabaab does is they go to the market and they go into the community and they see business women who are doing good business and who are, who are doing well, and then they invest in her. So I'll read you a thing, uh, some quotes. Al-Shabaab check at the market. When people are successful, they encourage them, they give them capital and they invest in them. 
but uh, specifically with women. Women do business on behalf of Al-Shabaab, even now. When they see a good business person, they give her money, they invest in her. They give her about $3,000, then they come back after two years and they say to her to give the money to somebody else. And, and, and so story after story, another, another quote about how they see women who are running a farm and so they'll give some woman, the woman some grain and they'll say to the woman, when the grain has grown, we're gonna come back and take a cut. Um, so there's a lot of, a lot of in, my, in my interviews, a lot of um, people started telling me about women actually running Al-Shabaab's businesses for them. Um, and one of the reasons, there's a number of different reasons that women are involved in running Al-Shabaab's businesses. I, I was asking people, why is this the case? Why are Al-Shabaab using women so heavily in these types of roles? And people were saying to me that it's because, first of all, a number of people said that you can trust women more. Al-Shabaab can trust women more. They think that they're easy, more easily to, easy to control. But other things as well, women are suspected less. Women can cross over checkpoints. They can cross from Al-Shabaab to non-Al-Shabaab territory much more easily. They can cross over the national borders into Kenya and into uh, neighboring countries. They can cross between different clan areas in a way that men cannot. Men are, Al-Shabaab men are much more suspected. And so if you wanna take goods over the borders, if you wanna do any sort of commercial ventures, having women be the ones to take the goods over attracts much less suspicion. So it gives, it gives a lot more access than men are able to have. Um, women get searched less. The chances are of a woman getting searched by a government checkpoint of actually getting searched properly are much less. People don't suspect women as much. And so people talked about the fact that it actually made a lot of sense for, for men, for Al-Shabaab to rely on women in this way, because women often went by unnoticed. They were not searched. They have a lot more access than men do in these areas. Um, in addition to the fact that women are actually directly carrying out businesses on behalf of Al-Shabaab, women are also bringing goods into Al-Shabaab territory, which are essential for subsistence of life. So women are responsible often for bringing fuel into other Al-Shabaab territory, for bringing some necessary food substances that are needed, for bringing certain um, clothing items. It's often women who, are, who bring these goods into Al-Shabaab territory, which Al-Shabaab needs in order to keep um, society going there. And so I think that's the one really interesting thing is if you, if you dig down into their businesses, you'll often see a very, very big female face in them. Uh, women are involved in taxation. Um, sometimes women are actually involved as, as the people collecting taxes, although I found that that's very, very, very seldom. I've only heard one or two reports in all my interviews around women actually being tax collectors. But women are, tax is collected from women. And again, it's ironic. You know, they, they forbid, forbid women from working. Women are not, not supposed to be working, but they still go and collect taxes from women whenever women do earn. And I've got quotes that speak to that. Somebody said, um, if they see that you can produce anything, they'll let you. If they think you cannot do, do anything, then they'll make you stay, stay at home. They're not just sitting there saying, you're a woman, we're not gonna take tax. So women are supposed to stay at home, but if women can earn, earn anything, Al-Shabaab will tax them. Um, one of the things which was really ominous and it, uh, is that people, uh, Al-Shabaab demands taxes from people, including from women. And one of the things that they sometimes say is that if families don't have enough money for tax, they're given the option of handing over a child instead. And so the sort of like ominous side to the taxation is that like sometimes handing over children comes in lieu of tax when families can't afford to pay um, what's, required, what's asked of them. And um, we know that women play a very, very significant part in Al-Shabaab's um, fundraising. Women in, in Somali society, more broadly, women often play a big part in fundraising and the same applies within Al-Shabaab. And um, so there's lots and lots of evidence of women being the, the key players in Al-Shabaab's fundraising. Um, and this, you know, in some years back, there used to be these big fundraising events where people from the community would come and they would, um, people would like, at, there would be emotional talks and people would take off their jewelry and donate it to Al-Shabaab. But over the years, people stopped wanting to give their goods to Al-Shabaab since so people started leaving their jewelry and their valuables at home. And so Al-Shabaab has created a more systematized version of doing this. They've started to put, put together lists of, of women in the communities will put together lists of other women. And then they'll go to their houses according to the list and they'll collect their jewelry and they'll collect their valuables. So you see women being used to collect and women being the ones that, that, that goods and resources are collected from. Money laundering is another thing. I think in recent years, there's been a number of restrictions trying to limit Al-Shabaab's ability to move money and to move goods. Um, you know, there's been a number of like sanctions regimes and, and rules made around Al-Shabaab not using international banking systems. Um, and, and certainly there's been a lot of rules around, a, a lot of checkpoints between Al-Shabaab and non-Al-Shabaab territory. 
Um, and again, we see evidence that Al-Shabaab uses women to get around these. So where they can't move money the regular way, what they might sometimes do is buy a number of goods in one place and then, and then take the goods to another place and sell them as a way to launder money. And we know that women are very involved in that. Women are involved in buying the goods, transiting the goods, and then selling them on the other side. So they're very involved in Al-Shabaab's laundering um, scheme. Um, there's lots of other ways as well. I think, though, that there's plenty to get through in this panel. So should I, should I hand over there? Yes, thank you. Um, uh, Orly, I think, again, you did an uh, uh, excellent job <coughs> addressing the question uh, and, uh, and demonstrating the discontinuity, I mean, uh, within, within the group. The, the group holds deeply patriarchal views as, as to women's role in, in society, as you noted, yet, uh, obviously, women are, are actively involved in, in Shabazz's financial concerns, you know, running businesses on, on behalf of the group. Uh, as you, you noted, they, they move goods over the borders between Shabab uh, and government territory. I mean, they, and also, uh, fascinatingly enough, I mean, they play a leading role, uh, as you stated, in, um, in the group's fundraising operations. So, so the roles that women play are, uh, as, as, as you stated, are, are critical to the group's survival uh, because they help Shabab to, to fund uh, and therefore, again, as, as you nicely uh, put it, to, <clears throat> to sustain, you know, their, their war or their insurgency uh, against, um, you know, against uh, the government and, 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 uh, and, um, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> so now I'll, I'll turn to, um, <clears throat> to Omar Mahmoud. And again, just a reminder for the participants, our audience, uh, you can start, you know, submitting questions into the chat. Um, and, and again, we will, uh, we will try to answer them um, during the, the Q&A. So, um, <clears throat> Omar, you have heard how, and you know, obviously, how complex Shabab's you know, membership composition is, <clears throat> as, as Muhammad uh, described. Orly described this, this juncture between Shabab's, uh, you know, what they state they believe about the role of women, and how they <clears throat> actually utilize women. Uh, so, and, and both Muhammad and, and Orly, um, you know, highlighted how <clears throat> critically important it is to understand, you know, how Shabab operates, the parts that women play, uh, so that we can be better able, <clears throat> you know, to, to establish tailored interventions to, to deal with this, with this group. Similarly important is the complexity of the clan dynamics in, in Somalia and how it relates to, to Shabab. Um, and this must be understood uh, as well. So this would be my first question to you is, uh, you know, based on your extensive field work uh, and your knowledge, obviously, can you describe how Shabab's, um, you know, uh, uh, militants have embedded themselves in the. <laughs> sorry, they have embedded themselves in the dynamics of Somali politics, particularly through the clan system to extend uh, their reach across the country. So, Omar. Well, thank you so much, Anwar, and, and everyone for organizing this and being here and an opportunity here today. You know, I think just uh, maybe a quick overarching point based on what we've heard thus far, and that will obviously also influence what I'm going to say is, is Al-Shabaab clearly is a very pragmatic actor, and it's clearly a very adaptable actor. And in the latter, it adapts constantly and at a quicker rate than, it, than its adversaries, I'd say, um, meaning that it tends to be constantly a bit of a step ahead. And so that, that's, you know, some, some key through lines thinking about Al-Shabaab's trajectory over the past 15 years and, you know, where it was 15 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago is different than it is today as the environment has shifted and the group has shifted accordingly. Now, over the past few years, in terms of this question about how Al-Shabaab's embedded itself in the kind of daily Somali life, you know, I think there's maybe three kind of uh, broad strategies or trends, I think I can say when we're looking at uh, the group's evolution. You know, the first, um, I, I think, has been to avoid or kind of uh, tamper down on direct military engagement, you know, to preserve this advantage by 
avoiding direct contact, uh, combat with its adversaries, whether that's Amazon or the federal government, or when it does, making sure that it has kind of the, the element of surprise uh, within it. And so I think we've seen a lot of adjustments in terms of the group's military focus in, in that aspect. Now, the other two I'd point out, which might get uh, a bit closer to your question, is, is you know, one is Al-Shabaab's rural dominance. I, I think that's quite important when you look at why the group persists and why it's still around. You know, um, the, the sort of focus on the Somali side, on the Amazon side, has been really to recapture some urban centers. Um, but recapturing is one thing, holding is, is another, and you tend to get a bit bogged down, and we've seen a bit of an overstretch, and therefore these centers are really unconnected sort of nodes and, and pockets within there where Al-Shabaab has influence in between. And so that rural dominance is, is, is very key, as, as we've heard you know, from previous uh, presentations about how that plays into recruitment, how that plays into financial generation as well. And the third part of this, though, is this increasing urban penetration as well, uh, this, this shadow element uh, that we see and, and heard about as well. You know, that happens in, in Mogadishu, but other cities, you know, Al-Shabaab has extensive investments on the intelligence side, backed up by the threat of violence that has allowed it to penetrate. Uh, at the same time, you know, you've had a, had a government that's probably been more focused on internal political squabbles rather than the fight against Al-Shabaab. Um, really, I, th I think the past few years, the, the battle against Al-Shabaab has been a secondary priority at best. And so the group's been able to take advantage of that and further insert themselves into kind of daily uh, Somali life. Now, when it comes maybe specifically to, to the clan system, you know, technically Al-Shabaab presents itself as a super clan, you know, above clan in, in Somalia. That's part of their appeal to uh, focus on an Islamic identity and, and to say, you know, we don't play these clan politics, but, you know, the reality is, is, is quite different uh, as well. Um, you see a couple points maybe, maybe to make here. You know, one is Al-Shabaab's co-option of, of um, clan elders in areas under its control or in, in, in times where those elders flee or, or kind of resist them, kind of the replacement of, of those elders with, with Al-Shabaab appointed elders. Now, there's of course legitimacy concerns with that as well, but it, it really means that Al-Shabaab's using this institution rather than, than completely bypassing it. And just from my experience working with, with on, on some of these other groups, you know, for example, uh, Boko Haram in, in Nigeria, they very much sought to destroy kind of the, the local el elder system and whatnot, not in the way that Al-Shabaab is trying to co-opt it. So there's a recognition uh, that you need to work through these processes. Now, when it comes to, to clan relations, you know, I think we see a, a kind of two sides to this coin in Al-Shabaab. You know, you see times where they're in control of an area and where there's actually less conflict in that particular area because they are the security provider. They are the one tamping down on it. They, at times, kind of force through clan reconciliation conferences to ensure that there's not this division uh, under their, their control. Uh, that's usually a temporary element. Anytime you kind of see Al-Shabaab maybe removed from one of those areas, those, those reconciliations don't tend to be enduring. Uh, but there is a point to make here that Al-Shabaab can be a clan reconciler. At the same time, Al-Shabaab also actively stokes clan conflict for its own benefit. And so especially in, in, in communities divided, when the group kind of wants to move in, it will present itself as, as a vehicle, uh, often on behalf of the marginalized clan to, to combat you know, a, a stronger dominant clan. And you know, Somalia's uh, clan system in, in its recent history is rife with these sort of fault lines, which Al-Shabaab can take advantage of and position itself. And so it's, there's a very strategic uh, element to, to that sort of exploitation in which they insert themselves into these dynamics to the point where even we've seen cases where, you know, clans have, have maybe subclans have been uh, coming to some sort of agreement on their own and Al-Shabaab's uh, had some uh, ability to derail that or to ensure, you know, that that doesn't go forward because it would mean, you know, um, uh, less influence on, on their side. So I, I think you kind of see, you know, it's very context dependent, uh, but you see, you see them playing that, that role where, where they're bringing clans together under, under their um, uh, rule, but you also see their, their ability to be uh, quite divisive within that. And, and so I think those are key, you know, the overarching point of, of Shabab being such a pragmatic actor and adapting to the context in, in whatever way really, really suits them and honestly adapting at a way that's, um, uh, you know, ahead of, of its adversaries. Thanks, Omar. Thank you. Um, 
um, group is, is pragmatic, and adaptive to the context. I mean, the client system, as you described it, is, is very complex to obviously explain in, in this very brief uh, webinar, but Shabab, interestingly, has found ways to, to manage and even manipulate clan politics uh, uh, ingrained in Somali culture to its, to its advantage. I mean, Shabab seems to, to enjoy uh, you know, some level of population support. Uh, I mean, the group provides uh, some services, you know, distribute some levels of assistance to vulnerable populations, especially in rural Somalia. Uh, and this gains the group uh, some popular support. And at the same time, it undermines government's legitimacy because it showcases uh, the government's uh, <clears throat> uh, inability to provide such services. And that leads me to, to my second question to you, Omar, is, I mean, what do we know about, um, about Shabab's governance uh, system, I mean, especially when it comes you know, to its administrative, its judicial systems, uh, to the provision of, of services, mainly beyond clan affiliation? Um, and does, the, does this governance system, I mean, resonate with local communities? Uh, including women, obviously, and if it does, uh, you, know, you know how. So, Alma? Sure, it's an interesting question. You know, I think we, we should look at what Al-Shabaab provides in contrast also to the alternatives, so what the, what the federal government is, is providing. And if you see a context where, you know, people might be seeking a, a service uh, from Al-Shabaab's side, uh, it usually means they're probably not getting that from the federal government side, and, and that's a, a huge gap there. You know, it doesn't always necessarily imply popular support for the group, but it implies um, a degree of, of sort of support for that particular service, a degree of interest around that. Now, you know, I mean, I mean, this is kind of a wider point to say that, honestly, this is a competition between Al-Shabaab and, and, and the government. Al-Shabaab is a governing actor. It holds more territory than, than the government if, if you want to really measure its, its influence around that. Um, and in some ways, Al-Shabaab is, is winning that competition. There are some areas where, where the government holds, uh, holds an advantage. Um, but you know, one reason I think why Al-Shabaab is able to, to persist as, as the title of this um, uh, seminar kind of alludes to is when you look at it in comparison to the government, I mean, Al-Shabaab is more coherent. It, it is more united. You know, there's an ideological basis for its organization. It's not to say that everyone in the group adheres to that and follows that, uh, but it does provide it a, a backbone. If you look on the government side, you know, you've had a, a very fractured federal government that has, has gotten involved into disputes between themselves, squabbles between the, the government and, and the member states within Somalia as well. And so you don't see that same level of coherence. And, and so I think that provides Al-Shabaab, you know, a very distinct advantage. Uh, but as Omar was, you know, saying, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting how despite the, you know, the group's strict and, and often punitive approach, um, you know, Shabab delivers, you know, a level of, of order, uh, you know, justice and, and administration in the area it, it controls. And, uh, and many Somalis, they seem to, to value, you know, the justice and, and the relative security provided by Shabab, uh, especially when compared to the, to the alternative. I and mean, here when compared to the lawlessness that existed before the group's arrival, uh, but also, you know, to, uh, to what exists in some other parts of, of Somalia. So population support has been critical uh, to the group's uh, enduring uh, success. I know, Orly, you have, you have written uh, about this uh, as well, uh, this aspect of, of Shabab's governance system. So I don't know whether you want to, uh, to, to weigh in here while waiting for, uh, for Omar to, to come back. Just to echo with what's been said, I think that yeah. like, you know, Al-Shabaab provides in the context of the gap where services haven't been provided for years, where justice hasn't been provided for years, where security hasn't been provided for years. And, you know, I've spoken to many people who say, you know, like Al-Shabaab is harsh and their rules are not great and they take too much tax. But, you know, there is at least some security. At least it's not just absolute lawlessness and, um, you know, everyone doing whatever you want. So I think it's the justice particularly, which is seen as the, the really, really strong role. I will say, though, that, um, I, you know, my research in the last few years has really shown me that this claim about Al-Shabaab services is very overstated. You know, the, the, 
all these services in the context of the government who was not giving them. But, um, you know, I come back to the recently, I've interviewed quite a large sample of people. And one of the questions that we asked them was like, what with people in Al-Shabaab territory, from Al-Shabaab territory, we were saying to them, like, what services had, what were the services that were being yes. provided? And those people were very, like, emphatic that Al-Shabaab is <clears throat> no services. Um, they know they're not giving money to the poor. There's no health services. There's the, the services that they provide are justice and they provide education, but only through their religious education system. So no, like, uh, you know, no other type of education. So you've yes. got justice but outside of that the claims about al-shabaab being this impressive service provider are very very overstated and i think that like from what, I, what i can see the kind of discourse is changing now there seems to be more and more of an understanding that that actually isn't and um, the other thing which i've noticed the shift which i've noticed i'm not sure if this is you know but it's certainly something i've picked up is that it feels to me in my most recent bout of research that this feeling of population support has begun to wane that the population support was higher in previous years, but the, um, what I'm seeing now in my work is a lot, of, a lot more disillusionment, a lot more people feeling just blatantly angry. You know, I work in the context of the Al Shabaab defectors program, and I look at recruitment and I look at defection, and we're hearing a lot of stories about Al Shabaab really str struggling to recruit, struggling to hold on to people, struggling to hold on to um, support because people are starting to feel quite disillusioned with the lack of services, the harshness. So I do think that there's been a bit of a shift around that quite recently. Okay. Um, I'm, other panelists agree, but that's been an impression of mine. All right, thank you, Orly. Almar, uh, glad you're, you're 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 back. So. Sure. Uh, apologies for that. Internet just randomly <laughs> cut out for for no reason. It seems. Um, anyways, <laughs> uh, I, I think I'll just wrap up two points I was going to make uh, related to that question and, and then kind of touch off of or these uh, comments as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. Services are limited in Al Shabaab territory, but again, this is a comparison to what the government's providing as well. So if there are, even if this basic level of service uh, provides some sort of interest and whatnot, you know, we have to look at what is really the government doing to, to counter that and, and, and whatnot. The other point is absolutely, I think we see instances where what Al-Shabaab provides starts to outweigh what Al-Shabaab demands. And, and we've heard about the demands, whether that's on manpower recruitment, whether that's financially. And so you see resistance episodically through, through various communities, um, a resistance that's organized against Al-Shabaab. You know, often communities can hold out maybe for a little bit, but Al-Shabaab does have the, the, the uh, sort of um, military advantage and sometimes it's harder for those communities to continue. But we definitely see that popping up uh, here and there when that kind of shift, um, when, that, when that balance really shifts. Thank you, Almar. And that uh, takes us to the, to the last question uh, to you. Uh, you know, is there a place for for Shabab in Somalia's political landscape? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a, a great question. What we really need to be working towards, um, basically, for for this sort of uh, seminar and any sort of policies going forward. I mean, we've had a conflict that's dragged on for fifteen years. Um, we've had, yes, a government that, if you look at it on the surface, versus what existed ten years ago, is stronger on paper. But has that meaningfully shifted the war in any sort of way? Does that mean that we're any closer to a resolution of it? Uh, I, I would argue not. Um, and you already have, uh, you know, we, we've talked about the degree that Al Shabaab's embedded in Somali society. You already have a degree of interaction going back and forth between <clears throat> Al Shabaab and, and, and the government or, or other communities. You know, quite quite a bit. This isn't, you know, some uh, group that's that's quite hidden from from society. Rather, it's very much a, a part of it. Um, I, I think you also have some overlap if you really look into what Al Shabaab's preaching in some ways, you know, distance itself maybe from, from the extreme in, interpretation of, of some sort of ideology. But it, what, what are they asking for? You know, they're asking for foreign troops to be removed. That, that's a popular sentiment in, in Somalia. That's something that this current government in the negotiations about Amazon's future uh, is, is really kind of driving home. Uh, they, they ask for, you know, uh, implementation, greater implementation of Sharia. You know, I think that's also a popular sentiment in, in, in Somalia. And, you know, they're not the first ones to have a, a greater Somalia focus as well and, and, and focus on Somali inhabited areas rather than, than Somalia's borders itself. Um, so, so if you look at some of their messages and, and some of what they're, what they're uh, pushing there, there is um, some, some overlap there. So, so I do think we need to think about political solutions uh, if there's a way to figure out uh, a means to, to basically uh, you know, get, get the war to end uh, if Al-Shabaab's demands and what they're asking for can be accommodated in some sort of framework going forward. Now, 
I understand this is a very, very difficult and tricky question. Uh, I, I think it's going to take quite a long time. Um, you know, these are always kind of long-term views, uh, but I, I don't know if there's been enough focus on that side, um, at least for quite some time. You know, we, we have this focus on a military solution and this idea that, that if you continue with the military side of things, eventually you'll weaken Shabab enough that they'll come to the table. So there's a recognition that this ends in dialogue at some point, but it's a military way to get there. Well, are there other ways to get there? Are there other ways to, to, um, to, to speed that up? Um, and, and given how much we've seen Al Shabaab's embedded in, in Somalia, you know, I, I think it's hard to move forward if, if you don't have, um, uh, you know, uh, an inclusive sort of settlement. I think that's the struggle that's happened over the past 10 to 15 years. You haven't really had that settlement, honestly, enduring internally within the government, but then you've had actors outside of it. Now, of course, the biggest question here is, is, is Shabaab interested? And from, from an organizational standpoint, you know, I can't really point to any significant top level uh, indications that point to, to, to them being interested in dialogue. Um, at this point, you know, I, I, I think um, there's always these questions of why Shabab would want to engage, why it would need to engage, whether it views the government as a legitimate <coughs> enough actor, and all of those definitely need to be thought through. Um, but I, I think we can make a, an argument to Shabab that it would be in their interest to engage as well. Um, you know, there, there's war fatigue on all sides. This idea that Shabab could follow the Taliban's example and, and, and completely dominate Somalia is probably far-fetched. We've seen how external actors, even when domestic uh, constituents overrun in Somalia, how external actors have always kind of intervened to prevent this sort of victory. And, and geopolitics are changing, but uh, you know, it's, it's safe to assume that there'd be some level of resistance again going forward. So, so I think there's some arguments to make as well to the Shabab side. I think the main point is, you know, I, I can't say this is a magic bullet or, a, 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 you know, a, the solution. I think it needs to be part of the conversation. And I don't think it's been done in, in a sufficiently genuine enough role for quite some time. So, so it's probably time to revisit that. Okay, <clears throat> excellent. Thank you, uh, uh, Omar. I mean, the the potential for, for negotiations as a solution to the conflict in Somalia has been raised on you know, numerous uh, uh, occasions, uh, uh, obviously. I mean, whether the hardliners within Shabab recognize the current political system, uh, whether the Somali government or the international community are, are willing to recognize Shabab's position is, is obviously uh, a difficult uh, uh, question here. Uh, so now let's uh, let's let's move into the Q and A um, question. We'll have about uh, ten minutes <clears throat> or so. Um, I'm just going through <clears throat> the question. Give me a second. No mind. <clears throat> so I'll ask some questions in in English and uh, and others in <clears throat> in French. Okay, so the first uh, <clears throat> question is uh, uh, the image of Shabab described in conversation here, uh, which is a group that is uh, pragmatic, that is adaptable, <clears throat> you know, very economical in comparison to the Somali government, suggests that, that the group has remarkably astute and disciplined leadership. I mean, despite the continuous elimination of, of senior leaders from uh, CT, from counterterrorism action. So is, the question is, is uh, Shabab's persistence also due to its leadership development and, uh, and promotion? Um, so that's one question. Uh, second question is, you know, how is the Ethiopian conflict um, you know, the US withdrawal and Taliban takeover in Afghanistan likely to incentivize uh, Shabab activities. <clears throat> um, going forward, you know, how uh, should the international community deal with, with, with Shabab? Um, another question is, how is the maritime tension between Kenya and Somalia, you know, affecting the fight against uh, against uh, <clears throat> Shabab here. Um, and uh, the question back to the negotiations, you know, what you addressed to uh, Omar, um, is negotiations a viable option to, to end the war in Somalia? 
uh, and does Shabab pose a non-negotiable existential threat to the Somali state and the Kenya state? If it is, then uh, how can you <clears throat> how can you negotiate? So these are uh, the questions. Let's go now into the, the French. Um, okay, Kelly. Where is it that the most important, what are the um, biggest ethnic groups that are part of Al-Shabaab and what are the geographic areas that they control? You say that Shabaab um, manages legitimate businesses throughout the country. Currently, what is the legitimate government doing in, in Mogadishu. And the contradiction uh, between this principle that the women's place is in the house and their important roles in the economy. Regarding the role of women within Al-Shabaab, do they have access to modern education in order to play a role within the economy? What, what is their way of setting up these businesses? How do they get financed? Um, are there other sources for them to obtain funds from, from abroad? And the final question on women. It's to know whether women are an integral part of operations or, or in the planning of operations. Uh, okay, so a lot of, lot of questions uh, uh, there. So I will um, start with, um, uh, with, with, uh, with Omar. So if you want to, to address uh, uh, any of those that you see pertinent. Sure. Uh, I mean, a good amount of questions. Maybe I'll just make a, a few quick points uh, based on, on the ones I, I gathered um, so I don't take up um, too much time. I mean, the, the, the first one about the leadership development, I think, is quite an interesting one. You know, I think Al-Shabaab has been very good about suppressing internal dissent. Um, we've seen that at least two big bouts of that. You know, around 2013-14, there was, there was a power struggle within the movement, and you saw actually the flight of even very high-profile members or the killing of very high-profile members. Again, around 2015, when there was this, uh, you know, overture by the Islamic State, you know, Al-Shabaab very much clamped down again. And so, so I think that what that shows is, is that the movement's actually uh, decently centralized in that there is a hierarchical structure and then that leadership flows from, from the top down. And, and it raises the costs of those that challenge that. Now, some do leave, obviously, there's defector programs, there's others, high profiles that have kind of left. Um, but, but I think that gives it a bit of, of a coherence. And again, measuring that to the federal government side, I mean, I don't, I don't think we see that uh, at all. So, so I do think there's something there about its internal coherence, which gives it a bit of um, uh, an advantage. Um, the, the Ethiopian conflict and, and U.S. withdrawal, you know, I think that's that's uh, definitely encouraged Al-Shabaab, emboldened it. Um, you know, I, I can't say for certain to what degree Al-Shabaab is going to be able to take advantage of the, of the Ethiopian conflict, but some of the interviews we've done clearly suggest that, you know, group members are looking at Ethiopia. They've always looked at Ethiopia. They've never been able to penetrate it. Um, you know, this might be a, one, of, one of their better chances. So, so I do think that focus is there. This, this definitely emboldens them. You know, again, tying this into the idea about, you know, Amazon's mandate is up on, on December 31st, and there's still no agreement on, on the way forward. You know, there'll probably be some sort of rollover. But all of that kind of signals to Al-Shabaab that, you know, um, you know, waning uh, resistance is, is there to their path to power. So they can kind of continue with it. It, it kind of definitely uh, has that inspirational role. Um, and that's where I think I, we'd have to argue that regardless of that, you know, uh, unbridled chance to, to take what you assume probably is impossible. And that's why, you know, it still makes sense to, to negotiate. So that brings us to the negotiation question. You know, again, I think a lot of these are hard to tease out and it's speculation because we don't really know exactly what Al-Shabaab's top leadership is thinking. So my argument about this is, is yes, we can talk about the reasons not to negotiate and the reasons why it'll be difficult. And there's, there's many, many, many of those. We can spend all a whole seminar on them. Uh, but I think we need to test out some of this a little bit more. And even if the time is right, right, not right now, 
testing that out kind of gets a little bit of, of the positions down on paper and, and something maybe that can be revisited down the line. I think this is still very much a long term um, uh, prospect. And, and just on the Kenya Somalia maritime, I mean, the, you know, the lack of cooperation we see from politics, you know, stems obviously to the security fight as well. Um, and, and, you know, that's something that uh, unfortunately relations both in Somalia and within the region under, under the recent government, uh, under some lines have become quite inflamed. And Al-Shabaab has been very good about uh, finding ways uh, into exploiting those loopholes. Excellent, thank you, Omar. Uh, Orly? Um, <clears throat> let me uh, answer the questions that pertain to women. So there was a few questions there. The first one um, was talking about this really interesting contradiction between ideal, uh, Al-Shabaab's sort of stated ideological position about women and about the actual way in which we often see them using women. And I mean, I think, uh, I mean, I think it's so interesting. I think it really tells us a few really fascinating things about the group. The one thing it tells us, which has been raised a number of times now, is that Al-Shabaab is pragmatic, probably more than they're ideological. You know, they're a group that really claims to be about the ideology. But the more you look at them, the more you realize that often kind of pragmatism comes above ideology. And, and in, 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 in the more I study this group, the more I start to see that there's often like chinks in, in their claims. You know, what their, their ideological claims are often, you know, secondary to what they need to do to profit and what they need to do to subsist. And certainly I think that like what we see around women is just one of the various different places where this becomes evident. I think one of the other things about women, uh, about this disjuncture between their ideological position and their stance on women, um, and this is an argument put, put forward by, by a couple of other really, really good writers in Somalia, which I'm just kind of uh, paraphrasing, which is that Al-Shabaab is sort of playing to an audience. There's a number of audiences that they're trying to impress. And in some ways, their, their position around women is less about because they believe this and more about them playing to an audience. So Al-Shabaab is playing to a sort of an audience within Somalia as well as an audience outside of Somalia. And they're, they're claiming that we're an Islamist group, we're, we're going for an Islamist state. There's a kind of like religious nationalist um, message that they're putting out. And as well as a message that they're putting out to like the world, the, the kind of world jihadist movement, the Al-Qaeda and... And, and that movement. And so in some ways, the official position around women, this hardline position around women, is very much kind of communicating to the audience. It's what, it's what needs to be said to get that audience on board, even though we see that back home, back at the ranch, the actual treatment of women is often quite different. And um, with regards to the question around, do women, are women given access to basic education in order to allow them to fulfill roles? I think, I, let me answer that question with men and women, because I think that that question applies more broadly than just women. So you've got an Al-Shabaab territory, you don't have a proper education. You've got the Al-Shabaab Duxi and Madrasa system. You've got this system of Al-Shabaab education. So the, the younger kids go to the Duxi to learn um, Quranic resuscitation. After the Duxi at about 11, 12, you go to the, the Al-Shabaab Madrasa system. And then you know often the, the Madrasas are a, a thoroughfare into the ranks of the group. But so, so this sort of education system is really, really important to the group's indoctrination. And it's a very religious education system. Western education or secular education is not part of that. This is really, really interesting, though, because what we know is that Al-Shabaab's leadership is highly sophisticated. Their financial systems are highly sophisticated. Their accounting systems are highly sophisticated. So it's really fascinating that in a territory where people are given almost no formal education and where sort of the, the educational levels are so low, what you see is a group where perhaps the rank and file are highly uneducated, but we know that at least the leadership have very, very sophisticated skills. And so to answer your question, are women given access to that, that sort of technical education? No, but neither are the men. Uh, the, the leadership are, or the leadership seem to have that sort of capacity that in terms of general population of Al-Shabaab territory, male and female, proper education is not there. And I think that that's another really interesting sort of confusing finding that one sees if you look at the group. Um, there was another question that I, oh, the, the one, the final question was like a woman part of operations. And I'm assuming what you meant by that was um, military operations or operations in, in terms of the running of the group. One of the absolutely fascinating things about al-shabaab which for me has been one of the most interesting things is that unlike any other extremist group or terror group or jihadist group that i've ever studied uh women in al-shabaab are not on the al-shabaab basis so men are recruited to al-shabaab and men go off to the bases when women are recruited but the women are never on the bases and and they serve that women serve al-shabaab from the cities and the towns and the villages 
And I think that that's one of the most interesting things which really like characterizes participation in this group. Um, so I've, I've spoken to lots of people and I've, first of all, I've got, I've got quote after quote from defectors, male defectors of the group. You know, one guy said to me like, not one single sock was washed, not one single meal was cooked by Al-Shabaab for a woman, by a woman. Like they're emphatic about the fact that you'll never see any woman on a base, even in the most domestic roles. Um, but then I've got all these like testimonies from women and uh, about women's actual operational participation in the group. And people say women serve the group by phone. And this is really important. So the women are embedded in the cities and towns. They're hidden there. Nobody knows that they're Al-Shabaab members. But if Al-Shabaab needs to do an operation or needs to, needs to do an incursion in a city or a town or a village, they'll call the woman and the woman will help come and collect the weapons. The woman will tell them where the checkpoint is. The woman will tell them what sort of troop movement there is. So, you know, the women almost fall, form this like invisible layer that is in the cities and towns, which is highly, highly important for Al-Shabaab because it gives them this incredible operational reach in places where they don't have such a big presence. And so, you know, this invisible layer of woman, you know, I, I, I call it that, like, it's, it's massively important to the, to the group's ability to keep going. So, yeah, I think that for me, like, if I have to think about the women's participation is so, so interesting because of this one aspect, because of the fact that you see this stark divide between men in the bases and women in the towns. And I've never, ever seen another group, a comparable group that's the same. You know, most of the groups, uh, similar groups have their wives and have their kids on the bases with them. Al-Shabaab is the first place that I've seen where there's this absolute emphatic um, emphasis of the fact that you'll never find a woman in a base. Um, just something which I found really interesting. Um, let me hand over for there. <clears throat> Thank you, Ali. Uh, I'm gonna go to, uh, to, uh, to Mohammed. Uh, uh, Mohammed, if you can address the question on, on the uh, ethnic groups. I mean, what is the most important ethnic group of Shabaab? Uh, and then touch a little bit on the geographical areas that they control in. In, in Somalia. There was also a question linked to it, you know, what's the linkages between, you know, Shabab and, and, uh, and the global violent extremist movements, you know, PAG. And if you can be brief, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Anwar. And uh, the most important communities or clans in Al Shabab hail from southern regions. I mean, the clans and communities who uh, back up uh, Al-Shabaab fighters. They belong to the southern or uh, central Somali regions and the geographic areas of Al-Shabaab. They control stretches from central to southern Somalia. Although some parts of these areas are controlled by the Somali government, Amazon forces, Ethiopian and Kenyan forces, other many state actors, et cetera, et cetera. But we have to understand that uh, Al-Shabaab is open, as I mentioned earlier, to Somalis, all Somalis, and non-Somalis who would like to join them. But they operate in a specific geographical areas at the moment. So we need to investigate further why they always hold it up in these regions and why they are not in other areas of Somalia or the Somali inhabitant areas. So the other question is whether there is a proven link between Al-Shabaab and other Islamist groups in the sub-region or elsewhere. I think no one can prove or provide a proof as such links with which Al-Shabaab has other relative groups in Africa or elsewhere. Only Al-Shabaab can prove or disprove whether it has direct or indirect links or not. But there are a lot of assumptions that Al-Shabaab has links with this group and that group, but there has never been any proven and, uh, trend that we have observed over the years. As to the question about Al-Shabaab with regards to Ethiopia, if I may say something, there is nothing much that Al-Shabaab can gain from the ongoing Ethiopian armed conflict. The fight is now between a former enemy of Al-Shabaab, which is the TPLF versus Abiy Ahmed, who withdrew some of Ethiopian forces out of Somalia because of the pressure in the northern conflict in Ethiopia. But Al-Shabaab's emergence, we have to highlight that it was indirectly facilitated by the TPLF Ethiopian invasion of Southern Somalia in 2006. Um, for example, the indiscriminate use of heavy artillery by Ethiopian forces on Mogadishu civilians following the fall of the capital city in December 2006 led to unprecedented catastrophe that provided a public legitimacy for Al-Shabaab fighters at the time who projected themselves as the only force or military group in the country capable of an urban insurgence to force the Ethiopian troops out of Somalia 
in 2007 at that time, especially in January 2007 when Al-Shabaab began its insurgence in the midst of civilians in Mogadishu. Within the Union of Islamic Courts Force, Al-Shabaab fighters came to be nicknamed Madahjabis, which means in, in, uh, in English, head crackers, an indication of their ruthless style of war, reinforced by various clan militias in Mogadishu at the time, Al-Shabaab fighters were quick to present themselves as champions for the resistance of the Ethiopian invasion throughout January 2007 and up to and January 2009, Al-Shabaab fighters carried out a mixture of face-to-face -face and hit and run attacks against the Ethiopian forces. Al-Shabaab at the time consisted of a youth militant movement whose activities were concentrated on the Somali soil. And when the, after or before the US authorities sanctioned the Ethiopian invasion in 2006, and then designated Al-Shabaab as a terrorist organization in 2008. So when Ethiopia withdrew its force from Mogadishu in January 2009, the Union of Islamic Courts members were divided along the moderates in contrast with extremists by the US and the UN. Many Somalis were not expecting that the weakened Union of Islamic Courts members were about to be fighting among themselves afterwards. The Ethiopian forces left with the full knowledge that no similar cohesive movement as existed during the UIC time would again emerge to pose a challenge to their interests, which fundamentally departed from two objective is one to keep Somalia in a weakened position and second to safeguard guide specific clients most notably the numerous many states in the country as it was during the war wars. as a result the UIC fractured into three opposing groups first al-shabaab second Hezbollah islam the islamic part and the so-called moderate groups led by sharif Shahama, the former UIC leader al-shabaab then become a product of the Ethiopian david of the UIC without <coughs> anticipating the outcome so it came to emerge as the most powerful group of all, and it remains so to this day, standing still as an anti-Ethiopian insurgents, a kind of nationalistic and Islamic movement, even when al shabaabs relations with local communities are not now as warm as before, but it's a core conviction for al shabaab that it's fighting through a combination of nationalistic and Islamic struggle to liberate Somalia for foreign rules, our foreign forces. Thank you. Very, very, very good. I know I don't have uh, much, much time. One quick question to, to Omar and be very brief, please. Uh, uh, one minute. We have a question here. Is, is it true that Shabab supports terrorist activity in Mozambique? Is there a relationship between Shabab in Somalia and, and Sunna group in, in Mozambique? And, and then because they have all this huge revenue and it's linked again, should, should we consider that the group may be supporting other groups in the region? Like the, I, I think where you see in, in Mozambique, and I'll rely on the work of some of my colleagues here, you know, I encourage others to look at what the ICG has done on, on Mozambique, uh, but the linkages I think we've seen thus far are more via the Islamic State Network, and so to, you know, there's a very small Islamic State cell in, in uh, Puntland and, you know, running throughout East Africa rather than, than Al-Shabaab itself, um, so I, I think Al-Shabaab does have or and definitely has in the past had linkages to groups in, in, in Kenya and, and whatnot. And, and obviously it attracts fighters from the region. And so that's another thing we have to kind of disentangle. Is, is that defensive because those countries are part of Amazon, for example, and present in Somalia and attacking it? Or is it part of its offensive capabilities? And that, that's something we'll have to obviously uh, kind of figure out, uh, I think, a little bit more going forward. Absolutely. Thank you. And we will return to. Uh... Uh, to this and, and, and other work we, uh, we would engage in. Uh, so that brings the, you know, the webinar to, uh, uh, to an end. The, the, I think the major point is that in, in the long run, I think the best means of, of tackling Shabab is, <clears throat> is try to reduce the movement's ability to leverage, uh, you know, the political and clan fissures to advance its, its goals. Because the drivers of conflict in Somalia are also political, they're also uh, communal. So if we neglect these aspects, um, <clears throat> you know, that would preclude <clears throat> sustainability of efforts. Um, in terms of dialogue with the violent extremist groups, obviously it's sensitive and, and complex uh, uh, understanding, but it might need to be explored, uh, you know, as, as, as an option that can complement existing counterterrorism approaches. There was the focus on service provision as a means to win support. So to reduce population support for Shabab and the government of Somalia, 
you know, and other relevant agencies should provide services that are distributed, you know, equitably across the country, uh, that are distributed in non-biased ways, obviously, that doesn't favor certain clans or populations above others. On women and, and the world economy, and again, here I refer you to Orly's piece that we shared with the participants, very, very interesting, is how do you degrade Shabab's uh, income generation capacity? We have to incorporate, as, as Orly noted and wrote, a gendered lens into any efforts to tackle Shabab's income generation capacity. So we have to consider the parts that, that women play in, in supporting these various Shabab income streams, as, as Orly again noted. Uh, in terms of uh, violent extremism financing, uh, same thing here. We should consider the role that women also play uh, in the supply, the transfer, and, and whitewashing uh, chain. And then uh, there needs to be income generation programs for women, obviously, across, uh, some, uh, across Somalia. So we need to, to draw women who are unable to work or earn away from, <coughs> from Shabab's um, territory. Again, I refer you to, to Orly's uh, excellent piece there. Uh, and that brings uh, an end to, uh, to this webinar. Please join me in thanking our uh, excellent uh, uh, experts, I have learned a lot, uh, and we will continue the discussion uh, moving work forward. And thank you to, to our audience and, and participants. Thank you very much. Stay well and stay safe. Thank you.